Hello everyone and welcome to Tomorrow News. So glad to have you citizens of Earth on board with us here today in my delightful, wonderful garage. Now this week we've got Ryan talking about SpaceX's DM2 mission, which is underway right now. I'll also be talking about traditions and test flights in the American space program. And in addition to that, we've got Dr. Tamitha Scove with this week's space weather. You're really gonna wanna watch it because the sun is kicking it up a notch. And she's also gonna talk a little bit about how space weather affects rocket launches, which is something you'll need to know a little bit later down the line when we're starting to launch people a little more often. Now, just want to remind you before we officially get into everything that if you like what we're doing here at Tomorrow, don't forget to subscribe to us, hit the like button, hit the notification bell somewhere. It's somewhere in there. You'll correct me in the comments and share us everywhere you can. So if you really like what we're doing here at Tomorrow, make sure to share it everywhere you can. And if you really don't like what we're doing here at Tomorrow, send this video to the people that you don't like. So let's go ahead and get started with this week's news for June 3rd, 2020. I'm going to hand it right over to Ryan. You have the con. Not much has happened for SpaceX this week. There's just one launch to the International Space Station. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA, go SpaceX, Godspeed, Bob and Doug. America has launched. I view, but we'll wait for confirmation of that landing shortly here. Yes! And there you can see on your screen, Falcon 9 has landed. This is the first Falcon 9 to carry humans to orbit. Humans are back in space from the USA. It's the first human launch for SpaceX ever, for a private company ever, and the first man launched to space in almost nine years from the US. Arriving at Launch Complex 39A for the second time this week in their stylish Tesla Model Xs, NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley boarded the Crew Dragon capsule, closed their visors and launched off into the sky. Of course, it was actually a bit more complicated than that, but the story doesn't end there. After a textbook lift off from the historic launch pad, which launched all of the missions for the moon and 82 space shuttle missions, the Dragon capsule and its crew was quickly whisked away up into orbit, where it slowly started to raise its orbit to meet the ISS. During the start of this period, the Falcon 9 booster B-1058 made its way down to the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You for another flawless landing. However, on the way to the ISS, the astronauts aboard performed a so-called media event where Doug Hurley told us that the capsule was to be named Endeavour. Partly because both him and Bob were performing an endeavour to test this new vehicle and the future of human spaceflight, and also because both of their first flights to space were on the Space Shuttle Endeavour. I'd also strongly recommend that if you haven't done so already that you watch the broadcast NASA has clipped up and put on their YouTube channel. Roughly 17 hours after launch, Dragon Ship Endeavour, as Elon Musk dubbed it, arrived at the ISS, specifically Waypoint Zero, which is just 400 metres away from the station, and performed the two-hour procedure to dock at the International Space Station. Exactly 8 years, 10 months, 12 days, 7 hours and 48 minutes after the crew of STS-135, including Doug Hurley, departed our home in low Earth orbit, the next American rocket and American crew arrived. The past few days have been very big for SpaceX as well as NASA and the entire space community as a whole, and we have finally gotten a reliable launch service from the USA that is capable of safely taking humans to orbit. Although the actual official certification of the Crew Dragon spacecraft cannot be completed until it has returned back to Earth, which should hopefully be happening in under four months, the proof that this spacecraft has gotten humans safely to space is still a huge accomplishment. A huge success for Falcon 9 and the Crew Dragon spacecraft came after a not so successful day for Starship SN4. When Elon Musk was leaving the KSC press site where he was at the time in the lead up to DM2, he said that unfortunately what we thought was going to be a minor test of a quick disconnect ended up being a big problem. What happened with SN4 is disappointing, however SpaceX are working on several vehicles in unison, so SN5 is up next to do what we all want to see a Starship do, which is hop 150 metres. For the time being, I hope that Bob and Doug have a fantastic time on orbit, but Jared, it's back over to you. 
Thanks for that doozy of an update, Ryan. Now, everybody sort of has their traditions that they do for launch day. During the shuttle program, I had two. Uh, one was that I would wake up in the morning with Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song being blasted as loud as possible. I suggest you do that anyhow. It gets you out of bed pretty pumped and ready to go. But on launch day, oh, it's excellent. Also, I'd have to have a donut for breakfast on launch day as well. Don't know why, I just started doing it, and they seemed to fly every time I had a donut, so donut on it. I did those two things for DM2, and I added on wearing my favorite pair of Nike Air Force Ones. Now, do you have any traditions that you have for launch day? If you do, let us know in the comments below. I really want to actually see what your traditions are, or if you want to come up with some, you know, tell me what you're going to come up with in the comments below as well. Now, Doug and Bob, they did come up with a couple new traditions for the astronauts to do when launching from Pad 39A. Doug and Bob both signed the walls of the White Room, and I figured that's going to be a new tradition that's going to happen there. And hey, that's a pretty cool tradition if you ask me. But there was a fantastic article on nasaspaceflight.com by Thomas Berghart that I really want to highlight. And I'm going to put a link in the description so that you can go give it a read yourself. I'm going to be giving a shortened version, but it's an absolutely incredible tradition, and I'm so glad that I now know about it. I want to give a big shout out to Alex Physics in our Discord server for showing us this amazing story. As an astronaut, you have some duties before you fly into space that help you familiarize yourself with what you're going to be experiencing. And one of those is being a member of the astronaut support personnel. These are the folks who help the astronauts get into the vehicle. In 2003, Doug was the head of the astronaut support personnel for the 28th mission of Space Shuttle Columbia, STS-107. As close out of the crew cabin was occurring, Commander Rick Husband grabbed Doug Hurley's name patch off of his white jumpsuit and placed it onto the panel above his seat. This is a tradition of shuttle commanders. Now, several photos taken on orbit showed that Doug's name patch was still there in the cockpit, and 16 days after launch, Columbia broke apart on reentry. Now, 17 years later in 2020, Doug has his first spacecraft command and he's getting buckled into his seat. Now, watch what his hands do. Members to complete cargo load at T minus 24 hours and crew ingress at T minus. Tradition continued, friend honored. Like I mentioned, make sure to check out the amazing nasaspaceflight.com article I'll be linking down in the description for a more detailed look at some of these traditions. It's been nearly four decades since the last American spacecraft performed a test flight with a crew on board. So what were those missions that did so before this one? For the Mercury program, there's really no official crewed test flight because of the suborbital then orbital nature of it. If you've got an opinion about which Mercury flight should be viewed as the official test flight, drop that idea in the comments. For now, I'll just do what I do and declare my own reality and make that official test flight Mercury Redstone 2. Congrats, Ham. You did a great job. March 23rd, 1965 saw two spaceflight legends, Gus Grissom and John Young, teaming up for the first flight of the Gemini capsule, a new two crew member spacecraft. The Gemini 3 mission lasted for four orbits, becoming the first spacecraft to change its orbit and included a corned beef sandwich smuggled aboard. The only real problem, Gemini's lift generated on re-entry didn't quite match the models. It was lower than expected, and this caused Gemini to land about 84 kilometers short of its intended target. But it was a successful test flight, and this was Gus Grissom's last space flight. Gus Grissom dubbed his Gemini 3 capsule the Molly Brown. This was sort of tongue in cheek because his Mercury capsule had sunk into the Atlantic Ocean. And Molly Brown, you might know her a little bit better as the unsinkable Molly Brown, who was an American socialite on the Titanic and tried to convince her lifeboat to head back out to pick up survivors. Now, NASA management was not very pleased to hear about this, and they suggested that Grissom pick a different name. So he came back to them and said, well, hey, what about Titanic? And after that, NASA management decided to allow him to keep Molly Brown. October 11th, 1968 saw the first Apollo flight with crew, Apollo 7. Commander Wally Schirra, Command Module Pilot Don Isley, and Lunar Module Pilot Walter R. Cunningham, the largest American crew yet. Now, they were flying on a Saturn 1B with only the Apollo Command and Service Module. They had a mission length that was dependent upon how well the systems did, and the spacecraft performed excellent, going the full 
11 days. However, the astronauts, well, Shira developed a head cold, which was promptly shared with Isley and Cunningham, and everybody got a bit cranky. At one point, Shira told NASA flight director Chris Kraft that he could go to hell, and even though they were rather testy, it wasn't a f mutiny, you f stupid as clickbait writers. Now, the mission was a success, but Isley and Cunningham never flew again because of their attitudes, and Shira had announced his retirement before the flight. Then we go to April 12th, 1981, STS-1, the first flight of a space shuttle, with Columbia taking the first trip. John Young gets his second command and participates in his second test flight, while Robert Crippen flies as the pilot. Now, this is something that's never happened before, a first flight of a spacecraft with its crew aboard. It is, simply put, the gutsiest test flight anyone has ever done, and will likely never see that level of blatant disregard for engineering humility again. But wow, it was one hell of a test flight, proving that a winged vehicle could work as a spacecraft. Now, as to whether shuttle did what it was supposed to, that's a debate that can go on longer than Columbia's rollout at Edwards Air Force Base. But with all eyes on Crew Dragon Endeavor, it wasn't just meat that was being sent up into space this week. Let's go ahead and jump right into our space traffic, and we're gonna be spending our entire time in China. We kick out the jam, starting with a long March 11, lifting off from the Zhishang Satellite Launch Center on May 29th at 2013 Universal Time. The all-solid propellant rocket carried and successfully deployed two satellites into low Earth orbit, with the only information released noting that they will be used for technology experiments. On May 31st at 0853 Universal, a Long March 2D booster lifted off from the Jiquan Space Center. It successfully deployed Gaofen 902, a remote sensing satellite that uses an optical camera with a resolution of one meter. A secondary payload was delivered, a small satellite to provide tracking of ships, aircraft, and environmental monitoring for a Beijing-based company called Head Aerospace. And now for this week's space weather, along with how space weather can impact launches, here is Dr. Tamitha Scove. I think the sun is celebrating the success of the SpaceX Dragon launch endeavor with the American astronauts on board just as much as we are because, oh my gosh, what a difference a few days make. We've had two big M-class flares, the first of the new solar cycle launched with radio bursts and solar storms. It's been amazing. As we switch to our front side sun, you can see the bad boy in the northeast limb here. This is region 2764 and is the reason why we've been getting a lot of these big flares. It has caused these two M-class flares, believe it or not, right before the SpaceX launch, and it got me a little nervous that we were going to start having radio communications issues. But it has begun to kind of cool down just a little bit, thank goodness. But you can also see we had another region here that has also been firing off solar storms. As a matter of fact, we've had two solar storms, very weak ones, hit Earth. Some have been bringing aurora clear down to mid-latitudes. We've seen aurora in the UK, we've seen it in Canada, and even down in the United States, and up into New Zealand. So, wow, welcome to the new cycle, huh? And then there's even more activity on the sun's far side, but I'll get to that in just a second. Meanwhile, we also have a small coronal hole that's rotating into the Earth strike zone, and yes, we could be getting some more aurora here very shortly. So aurora photographers have definitely something to look forward to. And as we switch to our far-sided view of the sun, this is Stereo A and it's looking at the sun pretty much from the side. You can see back in late May, that region in the north, that's bad boy region 2764, and watch it. Bam, right there, it fires off a big solar flare and solar storm, and bam, it fires off yet another one. Those are the two M-class flares, but hey, look down here, we have this region in the south, and bam, it's firing stuff off. You got a region over here, bam, it's firing stuff off. Oh my goodness, we are suddenly in the throes of solar cycle 25. We've got tons of radio bursts happening and possibility for big flares again, especially as this region continues to rotate back into Earth view. Now, as we take a look at the radio burst data, 
This is the radio burst data from stereo itself. So it's looking at the sun and this is the view it sees. Look at all these black lines, shoop, shoop, shoop. These are all radio bursts that could be causing issues. We are seeing some of them at earth and I've seen them gone up to almost about 100 megahertz. So you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, if you are hearing noise on the bands, it's due to these regions here and expect that, that noise to continue to get louder as these regions rotate more into earth. Earth view. So that's going to be an issue, but here is the really neat thing. If we switch to our x-ray flux, you can see back late on in May, on the 28th is when you started seeing that, that x-ray flux rise up a little bit, and then wham, wham, you see those two big flares? Those are the M-class flares that occurred right there on the 30th, but then luckily everything kind of quieted down, and look how quiet it was for the launch of the SpaceX capsule. So I was so grateful because during this period I was biting my nails worrying that we were going to have radio bursts and possibly radio communications errors and possibly even a scrub if these solar flares were larger and lasted longer than they did. Thank goodness that's been quiet, but now as you see in the beginning of June, that noise is beginning to ramp up again, and that's because of the other region in the southern hemisphere. That's probably going to be labeled region 2765, and we may be in yet for a show. For more details on this week's space weather, including how these new cycle active regions might affect radio communications, GPS reception, and other kinds of space traffic, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. And to wrap up this week's news, I want to thank all of you who help contribute to the shows of tomorrow. We seriously cannot do these shows without you and each and every one of you who helps us out. You are absolutely amazing and it is greatly appreciated. And if you'd like to contribute to the shows of tomorrow, head on over to youtube.com slash tmro slash join to do so and check out all the great rewards that we have available to you at the different levels of support. Of course, watching our shows, liking, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing us everywhere that you can is an incredible help as well. And that's it for this week's edition of Tomorrow News. Thank you so much for joining us. And until the next one, stay healthy, stay safe, and keep exploring. Oh, man, this better go. I mean, it's, I, look, I put on my, my worm today, and I also put on... My finest Air Force ones as well. These take 10 minutes to put on. This better go. I really hope this goes. Although if something isn't good, it shouldn't go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Let's go. Go and go. Yes. Yes! Reports say all systems are go. <laughs> supersonic. We've exceeded Mach 1 on the Falcon 9. It's from the second stage of the Falcon 9 after the upper Dragon stage gets a chance. Dragon nominal trajectory. Dragon separating. separating. And there's that call out. Dragon is now officially making its way to the International Space Station today.